Good morning, everybody. How are you all doing? Th thank you very much for t uh, spending the morning with us. Uh, we are delighted and honored to be uh, recipients of the, uh, the UPS George D. Smith Prize. And um, it's, uh, it's a great opportunity to share what we are doing with you. Um, we, have a, we have created a unique and distinctive uh, analytics program uh, at the Heinz College. Uh, Heinz is home to two schools at Carnegie Mellon, the Information Systems School at Carnegie Mellon and the Public Policy School at Carnegie Mellon, a very unique and distinctive blend of analytics, uh, technology, and public policy. It was founded uh, close to 50 years ago now by Bill Cooper, who was a legendary operations researcher with the vision of educating men and women of intelligent action. The two words intelligent and action are particularly uh, meaningful to us. Uh, by intelligent, we take it to mean that we want our students upon completion of the program to be capable of conducting data-driven analysis and be able to cap be capable of engaging in data-driven decision making. But we want them to do more than just analytics and analysis. We want to have them engage in the real world. And that's where the action part comes in. And it's about being able to engage and engender change through analytic-based interventions. And I'd like to begin by giving you uh, three brief examples of work that our students have done. Uh, but rather than have me tell you that, I'd like to have our partners, our clients, tell you what our students have done. Nightway has an important resource for people who are struggling financially. These are people with disabilities, frail seniors, uh, the victims of disasters, disadvantaged children. But a lot of people call our 211 helpline uh, looking to keep their utilities on in our cold winters. We don't have the resources to solve all the problems, but the Heinz College students help us to really figure out what are the critical issues they did the analytics. They looked at um, what Pennsylvania was doing and what we could be doing because other states and other jurisdictions had really focused on how do you help the aging, the frail aging caregiver of uh, adults with disabilities. And out of it came a fantastic report, uh, Closing the Gap. And uh, it's a report that we've sat with the governor's office in Pennsylvania twice and we're actually getting proposals from the governor to the legislature to help these families, all because we had the data, we had the analytics, and we had the really strong analysis of what others were doing that we could do better. We're very grateful to Heinz College students because this helps real people uh, in real time who are ha having terrible real situations. One of our providers, a cardiologist, was concerned that some of the echocardiograms that were being ordered might be inappropriate. So using data analytics in the students from the Heinz College, we were able to analyze uh, data on a relatively large subset of patients to understand that potentially some of these tests could be inappropriate. We did find out through the use of the analytic tools that they used that some of the testing was inappropriate. So where this becomes important is we are able to, if we are able to eliminate some of the inappropriate testing, we are then able to provide better access to patients because we don't waste tests on patients that don't actually need the testing done. So this was an important project for us and for the students because it accomplished several goals. We were able to work with the students and understand what their analytic capabilities were and use those analytic capabilities to actually provide a healthcare solution that can improve the access to care for veterans at the VA Pittsburgh healthcare system. The students were also able to apply machine learning and data mining to this project. Their students are very engaged, intelligent, driven, and motivated. They possess top-notch analytical skills that they get at the university. Nationally, inappropriate testing may impact thousands of veterans in their access to care, so a project like this can have 
extremely high importance across a healthcare system as large as the VA. This project also has great capabilities because the approach that they took in using analytics to understand how to solve a problem related to inappropriate testing could be applied to other types of testing in the healthcare uh, arena. We also have some interesting work planned to develop some data mining tools to help clinicians research and understand how to better to treat their patients. The interesting part of that work will be building relations between structured and unstructured data to help clinicians manage large populations of patients. The mission of REACT, the Real Estate Assessment Center, is to assess the affordable housing in the United States. We provide housing for about 4.4 million families. That's about 10 million people that wouldn't have a place to live if we weren't providing this kind of housing. Let me talk about a particular project that we are working on now with our current Heinz College student who is doing a tremendous job for us. We have a physical inspection standard called Uniform Physical Condition Standards, and we use that across the country. We have collected inspections on, as I said, six million units times 20 years of data. That's a lot of data. And what we use in this metadata is a lot of analytical tools. And we can really look at the condition of the property, assess risk, and be able to assist those families most in need. Our current student, Megan, is spending an awful lot of time organizing all of our data so that we can truly start seeing trends, looking at the clusters of data to ascertain that we have the type of prediction qualities that we want and be able to do risk management in a much more effective way. The Carnegie Mellon effort and working specifically with analytics and the data that they have provided to us and the different ways of using this data has been very, very important in our quest to make sure that we're effective federal regulators. The project that we are working on has the potential to save millions of taxpayers' dollars. The biggest savings is not that of the dollars being given back to Treasury. More importantly, it's that every dollar is being spent to provide affordable housing in the way that we, the American people, expect to see it provided. In each of these three examples of societal problem solving that you heard about, I'd like to highlight um, three elements. Uh, the first relates to the kind of methodological skills our students brought to the table, be it mining of two-on-one -on -one calls and doing supply-demand matching or cluster analysis or classification using naive base. Uh, the second piece is being able to either build systems and deploy them and or develop reports that are very insightful, that have high impact from a policy-making standpoint. And third, you heard them talk about the kind of engagement our students have to bring about change. Um, what kind of curriculum might be required to actually prepare our students to be able to engage in these kinds of projects? What I'd like to uh, do now is to take you through the curriculum to tell you a little bit about what we do uh, by way of uh, our educational programs. We have about 500 students a year that graduate from the Heinz College in, from both the schools, the Public Policy School and the Information System School. And every student at the Heinz College, bar none, gets this education where they get a foundation where in analytics where everybody gets a course in stochastic optimization and deterministic optimization a course in economics, and a course in statistics. This lays the analytic foundation for everybody. To add to that, in, rec in recognition of the fact that data is never analysis ready, we've always had a deep commitment to educating students in information technology to have them be able to work with data, to massage it, to manipulate it, to get it to be analysis ready. But it's more than that. Today we have data of multiple types from non-numeric data. You know, you have text data, you have image data. For instance, you heard uh, the VA talk about unstructured data. So being able to manage these different data types and to do it in non-relational, no-SQL kind of formats 
being able to deal with the demands of um, new kinds of analytics, streaming analytics, not just uh, batch analytics uh, off of enterprise, enterprise systems. This capacity to bring together analytics and technology is what the second layer is really designed to do. But neither of these two layers would quite have the impact that we'd like for them to have, if not for the third layer, which is about deployment skills. Uh, we really believe in the need for students to develop strong speaking skills, writing skills, teamwork skills, the capacity to negotiate and lead change. And this is sort of the foundational core for all of our students. But in recognition of both industry demand and of student interest, we have an advanced analytic track where students in this track have, in addition to what I just told you about as a common core, have a deeper dive where they trade off electives for what they're required to do as part of the core, which is a, a deeper dive into analytic training, where students will all take courses in uh, econometrics, in um, coursework like in uh, programming, R for analytics, data mining, machine learning, etc. The important thing to note here is, unlike many other programs, uh, while we do emphasize predictive analytics and optimization, we go beyond that to emphasize causal inference. So this idea of providing holistic analytic training, we believe requires you to understand not only predictive analytics that's often correlation-based, but you really need to understand how to establish causality. And this really comes from our roots in trying to combine operations research uh, and machine learning type training with the kind of focus on causality that social science brings to bear. You know, that's the sort of the holistic training that we seek to offer. So over and above the core coursework that I've just outlined, we have a rich variety of courses that are elective courses. Uh, again, organized along the three layers that I talked about, analytic, foundations, technology, and deployment skills. I'd like to highlight a few of these courses for you. And while it's organized in two columns, um, uh, by the School of Public Policy or the School of Information Systems, we do not have departments and we don't have the siloing. So oftentimes you'll find, in fact, you'll hear from one of our students, uh, Sean, who's a public policy student, and they take courses that are being offered in the Information Systems School. And vice versa, you'll hear from Carla, who's an Information Systems student. She takes courses in the Public Policy School. This capacity to sort of draw on and leverage the coursework in both of the schools is a huge advantage. And in, in, if you take the econometrics courses that you see there, many analytics programs do not teach econometrics. We believe it's really important to teach that because there's a big emphasis on causality and me mechanisms to establish causality that econometrics teaches that rounds out the training in optimization and machine learning and predictive analytics. On the right, you see text analytics. I mean, five years ago, we didn't have a course in text analytics. Now we do, uh, in recognition of the large amount of unstructured data um, that, uh, uh, that's available. Uh, in fact, you'll hear from Sean's project how they used uh, Twitter data, for instance, in their project. So I think text analytics is an example of a course that many of our policy students take. So this capacity to sort of bridge and cross boundaries is an important element of what we do. In, um, uh, in our uh, coursework on technology, many of our policy students will take courses in Python or R for the data and getting data ready for analysis. And vice versa, we'll fi we find that many of our students uh, in, the, in the information system school who are already very fluent in programming, taking courses that are very specific to policy context. And you'll hear more about it from our students. Finally, on the deployment skills side, to complement what I've already told you, we have we've been very fortunate to have alumni come back to teach courses like the Art and Science of Business Analytics. So this is a course that doesn't really talk about methods of data analytics, because that's already covered in the coursework, but it's about how to actually run client engagements. How do you use, uh, think about asking the right questions, structuring unstructured problems, what kind of data to collect, what's the right granularity of data to collect, how do you make do with incomplete data, you know, all of the kinds of things that you encounter in a real analytics project. That's really the kind of course 
uh, this, uh, the art and science of business analytics is. So in summary, if I were to take a step back, the, the coursework that we have, the curriculum that we have, serves uh, students both in terms of foundational uh, kinds of uh, ways in the manner that I spoke about. And as I said, 500 students get the, the foundational coursework that we offer. We get 100 students making their way through the advanced analytic track. So um, one-fifth of the students that graduate are in the advanced analytic track. And everybody gets this very rich variety of electives to draw from as well. Now, an important element that I've already sort of hinted at is the need to keep this kind of curriculum current. It's sort of constantly evolving. What are the mechanisms to keep it current and keep it relevant? In some cases, we lead industry. In other cases, we sort of are listening and responding to what industry needs. So let me tell you a little bit about that. But prior to going there, what I want to talk about is two really important elements that add to our deployment skills. This has to do with what we call our meta-curriculum. And this meta-curriculum focuses on deployment skills. And we work with the Army War College from Carlisle. They come down to, we just had this course actually this past weekend, where they have really unstructured kinds of problems for which there is no right or wrong answer, and have our students broken up into teams of seven with retired diplomats as mentors. And get students to think about how to problem solve and think analytically and think critically and to work with decision making under tight time constraints. Carla actually took part in the class and she can tell you a little bit about her experience. We find that this is a very useful device uh, also in terms of thinking of innovative ways of adding new modalities of courses. I mean, we have the traditional semester long courses, we have the half semester long courses, but this is an intensive mode course where we prep students ahead of the Army War College exercise with a, 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 a short uh, coursework on how to prepare for this type of class. And then there is a three-day workshop that the Army War College leads. In addition to that, we also send students to Gettysburg uh, to learn both the history of the battle, but also to understand that the uh, idea of decision-making under incomplete information and the uncertainty is really something that characterizes real-world decision-making and real-world organizations. And so these two elements of the meta-curriculum complement um, the curriculum that I outlined to you. Now, I should note to my earlier point, which is about how do we keep the curriculum uh, relevant and evolving, we didn't have these two uh, meta-curricular courses four years ago. So this is something that we have added in recognition of the need to have these elements. But we have a structured mechanism to think about uh, how to keep uh, the courses relevant and rigorous. The first one is I've already talked about the fact that alumni come back to teach a class. I mean, this is something that we've built a, a, a mechanism where we have uh, alumni coming back even while employed uh, to, uh, to uh, offer a class. The second uh, aspect of the alumni engagement is to have them be executives in residence. So we right now have an alumnus who um, had uh, led in the Pittsburgh Public Schools a science and technology magnet for eight years. And now he's actually spending the year thinking about how to rethink public education in light of all the changes in educational technology and the new uh, capability to gather data and think about analytics from an education standpoint. You think about micro schools, which is a sort of a disruptive innovation in terms of public school education. So having that capacity to uh, host individuals who think innovatively in our kind of environment is another mechanism. A third is to have faculty members take leaves of absence uh, to go spend time in companies and in government. So we've had faculty go spend time at Google, at Facebook, um, at uh, Microsoft, uh, but we've also had faculty take leaves of absence to serve on the Council of Economic Advisors of, the president, uh, of uh, president Obama and prior presidents. Uh, we've also had uh, the chief economist of the Federal Trade, Trade Commission as a Heinz faculty member, and the current chief technologist of the Federal Trade Commission as a Heinz faculty member. So this capacity to go back and forth means that the faculty get a sense for what's relevant so that when they come back, it gets incorporated into their pedagogy. I think that's a... This back and forth has been super useful. 
I'll be talking in, the, in a little bit about the number of projects that we engage in with our, with our partners. And given the size of our program, we have a large number of projects. And project activities entail not just the particular project and the feedback we get in the context of a particular project, but we have something called Innovation Day, where we present results of projects for the entire semester, and we invite the community in, we invite our partners in. That becomes a sort of a, an intense and rapid feedback mechanism. And over and above that, we have, of course, um, the accreditation-led cycle, which is on a regular cycle of five years, that requires you to sort of um, evaluate learning outcomes and evaluate uh, how relevant your curricula is. And we play in two spaces by virtue of the fact that we are an information school and we are also a public policy school. So there are two different uh, sorts of accreditation cycles that we engage in. So this is sort of the, the, the curriculum and how it comes together and how it evolves. But the, the neat thing is, how does this all sort of work for a student on the ground? How is he or she able to take these um, coursework that they learn, and how do they apply it? And it's not in the context of just one uh, class uh, or one project. Many of our courses incorporate project activity, from 200-hour projects all the way to 2,000-hour projects. But let me tell you about this by using a real student as an example. So meet Camilla. Um, Camilla is actually a real PhD, uh, uh, policy student, uh, public policy student at the Heinz College. Um, and uh, she is interested in analytics. Our median age for our students at the Heinz College is about 24 years old. They come to us after maybe a couple of years uh, of work. Um, Sean here came back to us after spending time in the Peace Corps. Um, and Carla here spent some time at Microsoft. We also have an interesting mix of backgrounds. Oftentimes, the students in the policy school are social scientists and liberal arts backgrounds. The students in the uh, IT school are computer scientists and engineers. So it's a really interesting mix of students in terms of their ca capacity to learn from one another as well. So Camilla um, begins her um, journey at the Heinz College. And in her first semester, she hears from leaders in industries that we engage with in technology, in consulting, in healthcare, and government. So that's Steve Shapiro, who's the chief medical officer of the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, Mayor Bill Peduto of Pittsburgh, and Secretary Fox, who leads the Federal Department of Transportation. She hears from these leaders, and her interests are piqued by wanting to work in city government and in healthcare. And we have eight research and industry-focused centers uh, at the Heinz College that students have the capacity to engage with, but given her interests, she chooses to focus on our Metro 21 initiative, which is our smart city initiative, um, as well as our Center for Health Analytics, which is our healthcare focus center. She uh, takes on a, an apprenticeship at the research center to be better get a sense of you know, what the uh, opportunity is that uh, she would be wanting to uh, pursue. And that leads her uh, to a summer internship, which is a required internship, uh, with the um, city of Pittsburgh Office of Innovation. And at the city of Pittsburgh's Office of Innovation, she leads an open data portal initiative. Um, and this is something that actually really happened. And uh, this open data portal initiative has now become uh, a best practice at the state of Pennsylvania. We had uh, Secretary Minnick uh, visiting us recently. And there's an opportunity for us to bring together the state and the city to, so that they could sort of have an opportunity for sharing of uh, information and best practices. So um, Camilla's experience with uh, leading an open data portal initiative and understanding all the various issues associated with that uh, then leads her to a course that's an in-class project. This is like you know a 200-hour uh, type of project activity that's in a class on social media analytics, which is actually a, a course offered via the Information Systems School, but the partner that's supporting that project, Kaiser Permanente, is a partner of the healthcare center. And she gets to work on this project, and then that leads her to a capstone project activity, which she works on with the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, which is a 2,000-hour uh, long project, which is usually done five students working together as a team 
like an on-demand consulting team working with uh, an organization. And this uh, project activity focuses on uh, the role of anticoagulant medication in hip and joint replacements, and that's been very impactful because it has to do with readmission rates uh, post hip and joint replacement. So very impactful kind of study. And following this, we have students like Camilla presenting in Industry Innovation Day, which I just mentioned to you, which is where there's a lot of interaction between the community, the clients, and the students, and that leads her to a position. In fact, she's going to be joining uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, which recently has established a, a, a large industry-focused center uh, at, at Heinz College. Now, this example that I've given you of Camilla, think about taking that and multiplying it 500-fold, because we have 500 students like Camilla, and to, 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 um, to provide the match to their varied interests, just these two centers have a large number of uh, partner firms that you see listed here. Um, and then over and above that, we have you know, the eight centers that I mentioned. So this is sort of the, uh, the ecosystem of partnerships that a student gets to experience uh, and it has the capacity to take um, courses, the in-class projects, the opportunity to do internships, the opportunity to do capstone projects. All of this comes together by virtue of uh, having this type of um, partnership system that has been put together. Now, you might be asking, you know, what does it take to do this kind of thing? What does it take to build this kind of uh, partnership system? We see this as a, a closed-loop uh, partnership model. And, um, and I've already talked about the industry focus center just now by telling you about the ecosystem it supports and the partnership opportunity that it affords to our students. Um, but in addition to that, we have this interaction between faculty and their engagements, which I talked about going back and forth, um, and our career services center that does a remarkable job connecting with alumni who bring back internships, who bring back employment opportunities, and if all of these work together in sync, and we have 12,000 alumni today, uh, that, and in addition to the um, organizations from the outside interested in our students, leads to the kind of opportunities where we are able to uh, execute 100 student projects a year, because like I said, 500 students, five students per team, 100 uh, projects a year, uh, and the capacity for organizations to hire from this really wonderful uh, and exciting pool of students. So that sort of is a quick summary of um, the, how these elements uh, come together. What I'd like to uh, sort of now transition to is, you know, these elements that I've just talked about are not some things that we've just developed today. Um, these have been uh, in place um, for, an, a, a, for a while. Um, and the scale at which we operate today is higher than certainly the scale at which we operated uh, when we were founded. But I'd like to um, call on my colleague, uh, Professor Al Bloomstein, uh, who was a former president of ORSA, TIMS, and INFORMS, and also a founding faculty member of the Heinz College to now speak uh, about uh, both the history of the Heinz College and uh, how it was founded and all the elements that went into it. Um, so let me uh, have uh, Al use the, uh, the microphone. Al, if you could stand. I, I thought it might be interesting to hear some of the history of uh, how we got to the kind of state that, that Krishnan just described. We were founded in 1968 when Richard King Mellon, who had been the prime mover of getting industry together to clear the dirty skies of Pittsburgh that prevailed until the 50s, and he got the, the city to clear itself up, changing bituminous coal, and, and really fi founding uh, the, the very lovely atmosphere that we ended up with today. In the 60s, however, Pittsburgh, as the rest of the country, was faced with lots of turmoil, many problems, many culture changes, and Mellon realized that this was beyond anything he could deal with. So what he decided was that we needed an academic institution to take those issues on. And uh, he 
gave a grant of $10 million to Carnegie Mellon University to set up something that was then called the School of Urban and Public Affairs. And the first dean who really set the tone for where we ended up uh, being and becoming was Bill Cooper, who, who was uh, then a major leader in the business school, then called Graduate School of Industrial Administration, or GSIA. And, and uh, Bill was drawn from that school to be the first dean uh, of uh, SUPA, as it was known, uh, and brought a number of faculty from the business school. And I met with him uh, in late 68 and uh, came in early 69 because I was aware of the enormous change that GSIA had made in the whole thrust of business education, hardening it, quantifying it, and, and, and becoming a leader. And I anticipated, I was working at the time at the Institute for Defense Analyses, a think tank in Washington, uh, and here was the opportunity to, to build on all of that and to make an impact in uh, generating new students to be trained in that whole arena. So uh, the, the new faculty uh, between 69 and 70 met to decide on the curriculum. And naturally, the curriculum included the hard courses of economics, statistics, operations research, management science, and a variety of, as well as management information systems even then. Uh, but but uh, it was clearly building on the tradition of Carnegie Mellon. The course I was particularly committed to was a course in uh, systems synthesis. System synthesis was a project course where there would be a client on the outside, a system on the outside, data regarding that system, and a need in one way or another to improve the effectiveness of that system. This is an article that was uh, published in 1976, uh, about uh, four years after our first class graduated, in Ebony Magazine, talking about the troubleshooters that were coming out of then SUPA, but also highlighting the data analysis classes, the analytic quantitative techniques that they were getting and the learning by doing, again, part of the deployment that Christian talked about, uh, and part of the, uh, and an important part of that was the system synthesis course, where we'd have six to eight students in a project working with a real client, a government agency in many cases, uh, or, or a corporation in some cases, finding ways to make that system better. It was the course that uh, I, I've described as the course that the students hate and the alumni love. Mm -hmm. the, the students hate because it's so different from the traditional academic classes. There was no answer in the back of the book. There was no structure that they were given. They had to develop the structure. They had to develop means of addressing a particular problem. They had to find what data they could use that would help in it. They would do some analysis, reach conclusions, and make recommendations, all of which were short of definitive results, but had to move from their results to so what. And so what became a major theme of the results of those project courses. It was, the, the, the school grew, our initial class was, had, uh, 12 students graduate. Uh, in, in 1986, I took over as dean and uh, pursued the same thrust of heavily analytic but connected to the outside world and recruited a bunch of uh, really sharp, brand new PhDs as faculty one of whom was John Calkins, who, who had done some work on drug issues when he was a PhD student at MIT in the OR Center. He's now the really the world's leading analyst of drug policy 
uh, bringing a whole variety of models to the table. Linda Babcock, who did her, was an economist at Wisconsin, uh, did a lot of work on game theory and has done some major contributions in negotiation, uh, teaching it, research in it, with, with some important research in, in gender-related factors in negotiation. And of course, a young guy out of uh, University of Texas at Austin, Ramaya Krishnan, who, who brought not only OR, but information systems to the table so that we realized that information systems were a growing need and, and Krishnan came in and started building that capability. All of that continued and I had set up an Urban Systems Institute to look at urban systems in a variety of ways and looked at transportation systems, looked at correction systems, looked at information systems, and particularly the interaction across them, including the human services system that, that provides an example of which was what you heard from uh, United Way. So the, the, the school grew and uh, we set up a separate school of information systems back in the early aughts, uh, augmenting this original school of urban and uh, a school of public policy and management. While I was dean, I changed the name from School of Urban and Public Affairs to the H. John Hines the uh, Third School of Public Policy and Management, and later on the School of Information Systems was added, so we had two schools, and there had to be an overseeing body that became the College of Information Systems and Public Policy, and that's the current situation today. We were fortunate that we had a, uh, in, in recent years, that we had a client, Bill Peduto. I'll bring it up. Yeah. One more click and well, you can introduce him. Yeah. We, we had a, a, an excellent mayor coming in a few years ago who was committed to innovation, rationality, and effective management, and he's been an effective client, and we've been working with him. A number of our alumni are now part of his inside team. He has been working with a number of student projects, and, and all of this has contributed to Pittsburgh being one of seven cities that is... Uh, candidate for $40 million from the federal government for smart cities innovation. So the school has really grown to the college and the richness of the various parts of the program. Let me turn it back to Krishna. A lot of cities have faith. universities or research facilities within their borders, but for the most part, they use it only in the capacity of research. Our partnership with Heinz College goes far beyond that. It, it's in the practical applications of how we deliver <laughs> our basic services to our people and how we can do it better. We have entered into an MOU with Heinz College and Carnegie Mellon University. It's a partnership which helps us not simply to be able to deliver our services more efficiently, more effectively, more equitably, but basically to transform the way we deliver services, period. One of the ways that we partner with Heinz College is through a research initiative called Metro 21. Basically, the city becomes an urban lab where we open up our streets, our departments, even our people. This partnership with Heinz College has now expanded beyond the city's borders and is now reaching out through our entire county and region. By partnering with our Port Authority, Heinz College students were able to track underutilized bus stops, places where people weren't using the buses and then finding areas where there was a capacity and a need and being able to give to the Port Authority real data in order to make the bus system more efficient for everyone. By working with Heinz College, our Pittsburgh Bureau of Police is able to use machine learning algorithms in order to take scarce resources and make them more effective. In department after department, we can use this same technique in order to be able to do so much more with less. Terrific. Um, we, you've heard about our, our curriculum. Um, you've heard about the ways in which we put it together, 
where students get to engage with the real world. You've heard about the history of the school. I'd like to now call on um, two current students to come and talk about their experiences. Um, Sean Butler will address us first. Uh, he's a public policy and management student in the advanced data analytics track. Sean. <clears throat> Morning. <clears throat> My name is Sean Butler. I'm a second year uh, public policy data analytics student at the Heinz College. And um, as Dean Krishnan mentioned, every student at Heinz, whether your background's in computer science or fine arts, really comes out of this program with a strong foundation in uh, analytics and uh, statistics. But what's really cool is that for within that 500 uh, body of students, about 100 of us get to dive a bit deeper through these specialized analytics tracks. So some of the coursework that I've taken on through this track includes uh, applied data science, data mining, data warehousing, data visualization, really introducing me to a variety of uh, statistical concepts as well as the um, analytical languages that support them. Uh, Professor Boomstein also discussed the system synthesis project. So today I just want to tell you a little bit about the uh, current project that I'm working on uh, with my systems group. So this was a, a student-initiated project where we propose to optimize university shuttle systems. Um, Carnegie Mellon University, as well as uh, the University of Pittsburgh next door, are uh, both urban campuses. And uh, many of the students at these universities work pretty late into the night, sometimes not leaving campus until 2 or 3 in the morning. And so these uh, shuttle systems really operate as a safe vehicle home in those late hours for the students. And we had uh, observed that uh, some of the service areas of both of the university shuttle systems were overlapping and wondered if we could integrate those in such a way uh, to better serve the entire student population. And so, uh, so we proposed the project and it was approved and uh, we spent the first month or so uh, interview interviewing several stakeholders and collecting data and eventually after that first month we hit a snag. And that's that approximately 84% of the University of Pittsburgh students living off campus and 72% of the Carnegie Mellon students living off campus don't report their student addresses. And so totaling across the two universities, that was like 25,000 uh, student addresses that the registrar was missing. And uh, it's really hard to optimize a problem when you don't even have the data there to support the optimization. So uh, about halfway through our project, we had to completely pivot the project and decided what if we can instead create a data visualization tool to better support evidence-based decision-making of these administrators. And uh, we did this in a, a few different ways, but for sake of time, I'm just going to talk about one today, and that's using social media data. Um, as, as you may know, a lot of these uh, social media sites, they'll allow you to uh, tag a location to your posts. And um, it turned out that uh, several professors and PhD students at Carnegie Mellon had been collecting Twitter data around Pittsburgh, the Pittsburgh area for a couple of years now. We are able to take this data and subset uh, geotagged tweets in such a way that it was comprised of Carnegie Mellon students, faculty, and staff. And then we could uh, map the remaining uh, geotagged tweets of that subset in a really kind of user-friendly uh, dashboard where the administrators could explore uh, student movement and living patterns by uh, you know time of day and day of week. And what this allowed the administrators to do was no longer make their uh, planning decisions based solely off of assumptions, but have some evidence to support them, allowing them to kind of serve those populations of students that may have previously been underserved by their, uh, their routing systems. And this, this is really something that I, there's no way I could have done it two years ago. Um, that's kind of the cool thing about the, the program at Heinz. It has the ability in terms of analytics of taking you from zero to 100. Um, I didn't come into the program with a strong quantitative or IT background. My BA was in international relations, which I uh, put into work serving with the Peace Corps in Indonesia uh, for a couple of years. And uh, that was a really great experience for me, the Peace Corps, being able to uh, work with the local communities there and empower <laughs> some of the population I was working with. But uh, I really realized that there was a ceiling as to how much, uh, how effective I could be without uh, that analytical background. And that's what I came to the Heinz College to attain. 
uh, and I could have received that analytical training from any of the Heinz programs, but I wanted more, which is why I picked that uh, data analytics track. So for me, the, the outcomes have been really great. Um, I currently lead recitations as a teaching assistant for uh, applied econometrics. Uh, landed an awesome internship this last uh, summer with PwC, and the uh, the job hunt's been really easy because I'm returning to the firm's analytics division uh, this coming fall. So. In a matter of two years, uh, I went with Heinz. I went from someone who honestly hadn't opened like a math textbook, probably since senior year of high school, to someone who's now able to empower others through analytics at one of the world's largest consulting firms. And that's what I really think Heinz is all about. It's not just about getting people, getting students to think analytically, but to training them to such a degree that they're able to use those analytic skills they have acquired to empower others. Thank you so much, Sean. <clears throat> I'd like to now call Carla Luyo to come and tell you about her academic journey. Carla. Thank you, Vin Krishna. Hi, I am Carla Luyo, and my experience is different to Sean's <clears throat> in some ways. So I was a computer science major at my home country of Peru, and I worked for Microsoft for a couple of years before uh, coming to Heinz. And, well, it's been a really great uh, time here. I wanted to get more education and thought that the number one ranked school of information systems was a pretty good choice. So this experience has been enriching for me in so many ways. And um, I wanted to tell you first that I am not one of the students of one of the programs, data intensive programs that Sean listed. Um, still, I've taken statistics, econometrics, management science, and a causal inference class. So the thing is like 100% correct when he mentions that we all get a lot of exposure to analytics. Um, I want to elaborate on that last class, the causal inference class, because for me, it was a game changer. It took me from a person who wanted a very technical software job after graduation to a person that wants to be a data scientist. Um, I want to convey that uh, transformation with a project that I made in that class. So um, who doesn't own a smartphone? I don't see anybody texting, and that's a great thing. Uh, we've kept you um, <laughs> up and running. Um, but well, these amazing devices um, empower us to do so many things until their battery dies. So during this class, I worked on a project where we analyze how users' intention to download an application changes when they have information of how that app drains your battery beforehand. So by using the concepts we learned in class, we captured not only correlation, but causation, and I, I loved it. Um, we designed an experiment. We had a control and a treatment group. We deployed a web page um, to run our A-B testing, not differently than what Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, or any other technical firm would do nowadays before releasing a new feature to their consumers. Um, so we gathered the results. We used statistics to analyze um, to analyze those results. Uh, we corroborated those results with more statistical tools, and it was great. Um, spoiler: uh, intention to download decreases when you have information of how an, an application drains your battery. Um, I really like those classes, but I still wanted to tell you something. So one of the things I love from Heinz is that blend of public policy and information systems. And when Dean Krishnan mentions that there's a very, say, blurry line between both schools, I'm a living example. Every semester, I love to take a class or two in the policy school. And I want to tell you about one I did last, last weekend. Um, so I participated in this Army War College exercise. I was actually the head of the U.S. delegation. It was a really cool experience. And I had the chance to negotiate with uh, Camila, which you met early. She was a top negotiator. Let me tell you about it. She was from the India delegation. So along with six other delegations with Heinz students, we worked through the course of a day and a half in the Kashmir conflict um, between India and Pakistan and used their critical thinking skills to negotiate our positions. It was an amazing experience and it helped us a lot to see how information we have beforehand helps us in these kind of processes. So you might wonder, why am I taking these policy classes being an information systems student? Well, I really believe that by exposing myself to different ways of seeing the world, I broaden my perspective. And by that, in the long run, it makes me a better analytics professional. So I really believe I am convinced that I couldn't have gotten this kind of training anywhere else in the world. So 
Thank you, Dean Krishnan. Thank you very much, Carla. And actually, when I, why don't you hang oh, on to this? Sure. Um, so you've, you've heard from uh, our, our students. I'd like to now tell you about how we think about impact. Um, certainly, having phenomenal students like this go out and uh, be recruited in the market certainly is a, is a huge um, and a significant uh, way of thinking about what our near-term impact is. Uh, we have a large number of firms uh, recruit on campus. They are uh, valued greatly in the marketplace. And in the last year and a half, we've had more than $30 million uh, of external funding in terms of industry centers being located at the Heinz College. Uh, but we believe that uh, our impact goes beyond uh, just the near-term impact that come from graduates that immediately leave the Heinz College. Uh, we want to prepare them for journeys that will allow them to have impact and success in the domains uh, and sectors of the economy uh, that we seek to make a contribution to. And um, in the four key sectors that we uh, engage with, uh, consulting, um, technology, uh, healthcare, and government, uh, we've had um, very successful leaders um, emerge uh, from our, the ranks of our alumni. And this is a, uh, an example, I think, of how the education prepares uh, our uh, alumni to not only uh, attain success, but to sort of navigate careers, oftentimes across sectors. They may start in the private sector, move to the public sector and back, or vice versa, uh, but along the way, um, make a significant difference uh, to societal problem solving. In addition to this, uh, you've heard a lot. I mean, Al began by saying right from the very genesis of the program, there were two key elements in, in the DNA of the school. One was the uh, uh, Bill Cooper's vision of intelligence, which is data-driven decision-making and analysis, the other part being action, which is systems projects. What happens to these systems projects? Now, we do a large number of them, as I have indicated, but some of them have actually gone on to uh, have considerable long lives and significant impact. Uh, how many of you got here using TSA PreCheck? Right? Good number of you used TSA PreCheck. The genesis of this were four uh, capstone systems projects done by Heinz students with the TSA post 9-11. Um, the a access, which is the leading um, paratransit um, uh, it's a, like it's Uber before its time is the way I want to think about it because it's shared rides for disabled seniors or disabled individuals so that they're picked up and dropped off wherever they need to go. And this, again, was something that began in 1974-75 as a systems project at the Heinz College. It's now actually deployed worldwide. It's certainly deployed across the country. So these are some examples of impact that have come from students pro student projects that began as capstone exercises, sometimes m over multiple years, but then have gone on to um, establish themselves outside of, outside of the Heinz College. Um, I, I want to um, uh, conclude uh, by sort of taking a step back and saying that the mix of elements that I've described to you, certainly many of these elements are replicable, and uh, in many of these areas uh, that we have sort of worked with, be it in policy, be it in information, or working with the private sector, the opportunity to have rich educational experiences for our students that combine curriculum plus experiential learning is something that uh, we feel strongly about and we feel that there's an opportunity to have great impact on society via the mechanisms that we have developed. Let me now uh, turn to some closing remarks. The great thing about Heinz students clients. is they come here with analytical skills. We want government to be data driven. We want government to be empirically based. And Heinz students just have that marvelous skill of understanding policy, but then also understanding data. Another aspect that really impresses me with Heinz students is that not just can they analyze data, but then they can communicate the findings based on that data. By taking our large data uh, and having it analyzed by uh, Carnegie Mellon Heinz faculty and students, we've been able to identify which of the many new drugs that are coming on the market are best for which patients to personalize the care. That will save us hundreds of millions of dollars. And we've actually taken a few of those Heinz College graduates and embedded them right here in the government in order to be able to make the changes that other cities will follow. We put it together in a package that allows our students to take these tools and make the world a better place. 
Thank you very much uh, for your attention and thank you for coming this morning.